mean, I wasn't expecting you to have this many sweaters to show. And action. Live from New York, it's show and tell. Welcome back. I'm Billy. This is a vintage knitting podcast. Today, I have a woman from the UK. Without further ado, I'm going to switch over and introduce you to her. Be right back. Okay, and I am back. Today, I have a guest coming to us from the UK, and I'm going to let her introduce herself, pronounce her name, and tell us the town that she's living in, and something about her town, a place for us to see in case we're ever tourists again. When will that day arrive? Okay, take it away. Hello from sunny England. My name is Yulia. Originally, I'm from Russia, but I lived in the UK for many years, and I live in a lovely part of the world in Southwest, in County of Devon, and in the city of Exeter. So if you're visiting my city right now, you'll probably be heading to our famous cathedral, which is very popular with tourists. We also have a river and a canal. And if you happen to be in our city this this summer, especially on Sunday, we have a lovely event, which is free, and it's called Jazz on the Key. So we have lo um, lovely live bands playing uh, jazz music from early jazz to swing, and it's every Sunday afternoon. So if you love dancing like me, it's a very great place to be. Um, it makes else? me want to get on an airplane right now. Yeah, <laughs> please do. We also have a local yarn shop as well. I believe it's the only um, yarn shop we have now in Exeter and it's called Woolen X. And what's interesting about it, um, recently they had um, organized special project called Yarn Bombing. So if you visit in our city now, you probably will see some streets covered in crochet flowers, petals, and it looks very pretty and summery. Goodness, it sounds so quaint and charming. Lovely, thank you. Thanks for telling us about that. I'm sure some people are gonna run over there right now. <laughs> I think a lot of people who watch my podcast live in the UK, so this might be doable for them. For me, I'd have to fly across the Atlantic Ocean soon. So this fall, I'm hoping. I'm sure. Okay, so let's talk about your sweater that you're wearing, which I just love, because I always love that sailor nautical motif. It's adorable. Yes, I had to find something that is lightest for this summer weather we're having right now. So this is made of cotton. And actually this is, unlike most of my vintage patterns, this one actually comes from magazine. And you can see this lovely lady, they're modeling it in this green color. So this is from Good, Good Needlework and Knitting um, magazine. And I'm just trying to find, I think it's called something snappiness about this. Yes, there is a snappiness about sailor collar. So this is really lovely. I think it's from 1934. And it was quite an easy knit made of four ply cotton, very summery, not too hot and very quirky as well. So I had to do um, crochet beret to go with it as well, made of white cotton. The sweater looks like garter stitch, is it? Or it's something else? Uh, it's not garter stitch. Um, it has mixture of um, pearls and knits. And it, yes, it is a little bit bumpy, but um, it's not garter stitch. It has a little bit of ribbon, it actually has got to stitch on, on the edge just to make it to stop from curling up. It's a very pretty stitch. It's interesting. Yeah, something, something different. I so it was it. done in pieces and then was sewn up together. Can you turn around so we can see the back? There's a collar in the back. Oh, look at that. It's so cute. Just adorable. Love it. Love it. I want that. <laughs> <laughs> I also like the color. Yeah, I decided to go. Um, I love it so much. So I'm going to make another one as well. So I chose um, 
a lot of people choose the green one as, a, as in a picture, but I decided to, that nice blue one will look better for, for the time being. It's great, it's great. Now let's talk about what's on the mannequin. Um, so this is, I believe, 1930s or 1940s pattern. Um, doesn't have date on the pattern, but it has it has features of 1930s look. It has long um, collar and fake buttons here, which you would not fake to start with, but I had to make them fake because um, it wouldn't lie straight. And it was originally from um, this pattern, which called plate pattern, plate, plate jumper. So I made lift a few adjustments to it and made um, my ribbon straight, not pointy like on the pattern. And I made my uh, sleeves long because I haven't got enough tops that have long sleeves, they're mostly short and I feel cold in the winter. So this is very nice and made of merino, which is nice and soft. And I had to add vertical lines afterwards by stitching it together, by stitching it up. Um, Yes, and to show the secret, it's meant to be opening up properly, but um, unfortunately I had to cheat. So this has poppers. <laughs> this is the only way to make it not, to make it straight. So, and to go with it, I knitted little berry with some pom-poms as well. <laughs> Adorable. And Actually, this jumper was used in our in recent short film as well, based in 1930s. So really, how did was, that happen? Um, because of my course, I was taking part in some filming as well, and um, I was taking part as an extra. I know it's only I would I probably wouldn't be visible there. Oh my goodness, we need to cut it off. <laughs> So, because of my course, I had chance to uh, participate in some a short film film um, sh filming of of short film. Oh my god, can't say it. <laughs> What's the name? What's the name of it? Um, unfortunately, I, I'm not allowed to say it moment because it's still in production. But oh. it's uh, as soon as I know, <laughs> everyone will hear about it. It's not. It's only a short um, independent filmmaker, but it was based in 1930s and it's something to do with the law and we use this jumper so when, an extra. when it comes out and you're able to <laughs> divulge the name there'll be show notes and there'll be comments below the show notes so you could just comment there because people will want to know later yes. on so they can go and look for you hopefully you're not cut out well even if it was, it would be just one second of fame, but just the <laughs> fact that some of my jump knitwears were used in film, that makes me feel quite happy. Oh, it's very exciting. Wow. Okay, I know you have a bunch oh, of other things, so let's I do roll it. So shall I start with something I've done for the first time? So all my knitting started because... Not because I wanted to knit, I was not interested in knitting at all, but I was interested in historical reenactment, as, as such as 1940s reenactment. And of course, part of reenactment, you have to dress up, you have to find costumes. And I was looking for 1940s type fur isle vests for ages. And all I could come across were really, really expensive, or it was just not very interesting. So in the end, I decided that I'm going to learn to knit and to make that vest. And of course, my first project had to be for Isle West. <laughs> and some of it, some part of it is here. I can show you. So I literally had to go on YouTube to learn how to cast on, learn about stranded knitting, learn how to do all these different things and how to catch floats. So this is my first ever knitted or part of knitted garment. And of course it was made with double knit wool. So it's made it very heavy and quite thick. And I never um, finished this, this end. I decided that my next project is going to be done with four ply wool, which by that time I knew about. And I will show you my second 
finished project, which is, I believe this is the best way, um, pattern. It's a 1940s pattern of short sleeve jumper and it's fair isle. And it's made with um, cascade yarns, just uh, fingering white yarn. And I changed my color palette to be more of a autumnal colors rather than colors that suggested in the pattern. And my idea was to make the top and to go, uh, like to make a twin set and to make a jumper, matching jump for it as well. But unfortunately, um, my tension was a bit too loose. So when I wear it, it's slightly, slightly buggy on me. So what I'm going to do, maybe one day I will make another one and then I'll make matching jump, matching cardigan to go with a new one, new top. So You can make something without sleeves to go under the cardigan yeah. and you don't have all that extra fabric. Yeah. So that was my second project. And um, while we're still on Fair Isle, this is the vest I made for my husband for reenactment events as well. Ah, oh, look at that. That took quite a while. It's all been made on four with four ply wool on two millimeter needles most of the time because I wanted it to make it quite dense. So you can see the close close up. The colors are really lovely, a little bit different. Yeah. So for this project, um, I was going to use, I was using the original pattern, which is in the swatch, but to make it larger size, instead of doing just a lot of repeats of this snowflake um, motif, I actually adjusted it and I made my snowflake a little bit larger. So I had to rewrite all pattern and all the chart to accommodate this size. And I think it worked okay. And how did, you, how did you do that? Did you do the chart on graph paper or do you yeah. use some software? Um, I didn't know at the time there is a software, the stitch count, I think it's called. Um, I was using just normal graph paper with a lot of squares and a lot mm -hmm. of Calvin pens. <laughs> so it's the old fashioned way. Good. There's nothing wrong with yeah. it. I know, which, you know, I didn't know about the software, people like that. So. And it was made with original um, vintage wool. Unfortunately, I don't have um, wool with me to show you, but um, this is what it looks like. And it's actually thin, it's actually free ply. It's very, very fine. So it's actually finer than more than four ply we have now, which I felt is very good use of this wool. And I enforced it as well with um, some silk lace as well to make it a little bit stronger. So that was my vest. And I got another feral jumper, which you probably see used in my YouTube profile. <laughs> this is best way, I think. Yes, this pattern. Mm -hmm. I really love it because um, the bottom made with um, normal four ply and the top made with marina, which is quite nice on round neck area. So it's still warm, but it's not as scratchy as the bottom part. Does it have a but, button in the back of the neck? Yes, it does. Yeah, it has a button there. That's a good tip for people. If they have a neckline that's too tight, mm -hmm. you can always open it up a little, um, steak maybe, and then just make a loop and a button. I should have yeah. thought of that once I made a baby sweater and the opening for the head was way too small for the baby. I should have done that. <laughs> yeah, so most of the time I, I remember to do that. And also good tip if you have um, sensitive skin like me, merino wool is not as scratchy. So, if you like plan to make to use merino wool for um, neck areas, another for Isle. 
Oh, lots of fair isle. Wow. <laughs> this is work, people. If you haven't knit fair isle, and it's front and back, right? Yeah. So this double um, the work. This button. Yes, and in this one is nice and soft. It was made with um, this wool, super snugly. And it's merino, but it's four ply merino, which is really nice and soft and it very, feels very cozy. So I like to wear that. And shall we look at my color work, but not for Ryan? Yes, um, anything you want to show us, of course. <laughs> this is wonderful. <laughs> okay. Um, for interesting uh, construction, I chose this one because this was this jumper started with just two stitches, so it was two stitches cast on. Yeah, no. <laughs> and th this in construction of it started right here, the bottom corner, not with ribbon at all. So we're, we're making this triangle, then we're making another triangle. And we join it together, and because it looks like a straight line, can't even show it to you now. So basically, that looks like a straight line because there are a lot of decreases in the middle and increases um, on a side that creates this diagonal corner. So, from the ribbing, well, the ribbing is put on afterwards. Yes, it's afterwards, okay. yeah. Okay, yeah. so this corner that you're talking about, you're starting to knit all the all the time on an angle. Yeah, so it looks like a, you're doing a triangle like that. And then you leave live, live stitches and then do another triangle. And then you join these two triangles together. And when they're formed, they are going to be like, slightly towards this side all right <laughs> they so, rotated <laughs> so you're joining these two triangles together by what technique mattress stitch or uh because it's life life um stitches you just join them together and carry on knitting introducing with um white wool so i'm confused there are two red triangles happening right yep two triangles okay. they are there but oh, we got this really how, do, how do the two triangles, the lower part, the red part, forget about the stripes for now, just these two red triangles, how mm -hmm. do they get connected up the center front? So starting, they start in a small two stitch, they grow big and bigger, big and become big. You leave starting like in the center with your two stitches and going outward? Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's how they start from the center. And dive stitches left there, put on the side. You got an, you make another triangle identical to it, and then you join your second triangle with the first one. So you got live stitches all along, and so it looks like that. When you start knitting, that becomes like that, and triangle, a new triangle forms this way. Ah. <laughs> not, not a scientific way to explain. Oh, okay, so it. It changes direction somehow. Yes. Wow. That, that is quite interesting construction. Anyone wants to experiment, I recommend this pattern. Very interesting. Super duper interesting. Like, yeah, but so effective. It's quite, quite simple, but so effective. Yeah. Same in the book and the back as well. This is why I love to talk to people from. <laughs> all around the world because everybody has something different. I've never seen anything like that. So for all the people watching, comment below if you've ever seen anything like that. That's like pure amazement to me. Wow. <laughs> Triangles, yeah. As soon as you said you cast on two stitches, I was like, okay, <laughs> this I <like> got here. <laughs> I know, I couldn't believe when I saw it in the, in the part. I thought I'd give it a go and see what happens. Great, great. Yeah. Cool. 
um, as you notice, I do love color and color of pattern all the time. So this was a, um, another jumper, which is not virile, but very, very simple to make. So if you know, any of your listeners actually like color work, but they're not, not brave enough to try um, virile, this is really good, um, effective and simple jump to knit. And of course you can use more colors if you like. I just used four. Um, don't think I have a pattern for it. Let me here. I think it's called lavender, list lavender rainbow jumper, and it's made with. Um, I made it with um, four ply cascade, cascade yarn again. It's really, really nice and it's closest to original three ply wool. That's in the pattern. Actually, I had um chance to. To get vintage pattern, vint vintage yarn, which is least lavender, and I have looked at what it what it feels like, and it feels like really nice fingering for ply wool. So I knew that I'm on the right track, and I used my buttons from my grandma as well, which is oh, something so simple but quite worked Color-wise, worked quite well. So that's that. Another jumper is from uh, I don't know if you've seen. There is a TV series called Home Fires. So this is jumper from I've seen in that TV program. Again, very simple color work. Increases and decreases create this zigzaggy lines mm -hmm. and um yeah so that's nice simple cotton nice and light for summer and that's nice summary one is victory jumper this pattern is actually available for free on um victoria and albert museum website if anybody wants to download it so this is what i wore um on may day on Victory Day. And I have a little red poppy as well. Poppy, yeah. And you made that poppy? Uh, actually, this poppy, more, I haven't made it. I bought it before I even thought of that I will ever be knitting. So this is oh. like a very old poppy. I suppose I could make one for next time. <laughs> so, um, um, economy jumper. As you know, we had um, on the Facebook page, we had some um, knit alone in the winter, which was economy jumper. Oh, no, I didn't know that. So, so good good for using your old yarns. Or old mm -hmm. bits. Um, originally, I was planning to do it from cotton yarn, but it turned out to be much too bright. And as you can see here, the swatches are there. I didn't like how bright they are, so I decided to, to use wool instead. But this is how basically it's constructed. You just make a lot of squares, join them together. You alternate pattern from seed stitch to, I'm not sure if it's rib, rib you know, I can't remember. Like a twisted rib, maybe. Yeah, I think it might be. So, and then you, you basically, you then join them together. But this was really economy jumper because um, I ran out of wool on and I made one sleeve and I ran out of the, that side, that yarn and I couldn't find it again because it was discontinued yarn. So I had to use my old stash and as you can see the jump the colors are a little different, <sighs> but likely it's not very noticeable. Well. I can mend and do. Exactly. Make do and mend. Yes, sorry. <laughs> yes. I knew what you meant. <laughs> Sometimes we get things up. Yes, I mean, it, it, during the war, it was tough times. People just used whatever materials they could get their hands on. Things were rationed. And if you had a little bit of this, a little bit of that, you put it together and look, you have a sweater. Yeah, so that's worked with me as well and last colorful i can show you is my stripe jumper 
which is flying color jumper. It is main, it's, I'm not sure the date on this jumper, but it looks like 1930s. It's very, very chilly and bright. And I love wearing it because it looks so casual and it's just for everyday wear. It's very, very happy colors. So you seem to stay very true to the colors of the pattern itself. Um, sort of, you know, muted and very vintage looking color. I, I do try. Yes, because obviously I'm, I am don't just need for everyday wear, I need specifically for reenactment. So I'm using colors that would have been good representation of 1940s, 1930s. So I do try to keep um, some um, subtle colors, but this one obviously not very subtle. <laughs> Are you researching um, that in vintage books or museums, or you're just going by what colors they mention in the pattern? Uh, I can see the all resources I have. Yes, I can see the colors they mention, mention in the pattern. Uh, books I have, as you can see, I have a lot of vintage books. Unfortunately, most of them are black and white. Mm. Uh, you can only guess, they, they do mention colors, but you can only guess what kind of shades they used. Um, so yes, um, like this jumper, um, this jumper here made with very bright mustard color. I don't know if it is very vintage uh, color, but it was made from, it was actually from the book um, by Jane Costa, I think. Jane Costa and Margaret. Murray and it's called afternoon jumper. So this is a simple stitch. It was considered a uh, vintage back then. So, and this is 1940s wartime book. It's amazing. How many people have these old books? Yeah, it's still out there floating around. People find them on eBay, I guess. Yeah, this is where I find mine. Yeah, it was nice to have it. Um, now the cardigan because you can ne never have too many cardigans. <laughs> um, don't know the name of this. It's called Megan cardigan. But for me, uh, when I started knitting it, I noticed that pattern actually makes quite a smiley face, <laughs> the triangle and um, the bumpy bits, they look like a smile. <laughs> yes, yeah. This is very smiley. It's very, Magic. it's very pretty. Again, a lot of work. Do you know how long it took you to make that? More than a month, definitely. Um, probably a couple of months, but it was knitting a lot. And it was obviously four ply wool and on 2.25 millimeters needles. Do you think this took longer than the Fair Isle or the Fair Isle takes longer? Mm, I would probably say the same. Same. Mm. Yeah, because you do have to have in mind that um, obviously it's not as hard as Fair Isle, not in terms hard, it's not hard, it's just uh, takes a lot of attention. So if you make a mistake in Fair Isle, you have to go back and correct this mistake because there's no way, because everything else will be messed up. Whereas with this one, it's quite easy to spot a mistake in time. So you don't have to go back quite such a long way. Um, yeah. So also made a um, 1940 style brooch to go with as well. You made so that? Yeah. Wow. Did you have a pattern for that or you just... Internet. <laughs> it was just internet and I looked, oh, I wow. could find my... It, it was made with uh, curtain rings, you know, like you kind of curtains on the rings. So I had a very thin one. So I just um, added... added um, thread around it and it was quite easy. I guess if you have a pattern and you're handy, 
it's very <laughs> I haven't seen anything like that very attractive so let's talk about the cabinet that is behind oh. you because that looks very interesting <laughs> and you have some yarn in there I see I have some yarn but it's probably about like two percent of what I normally have um, this is a 1950s cabinet and it was um, made of dark wood originally and I have cycled it and painted it and it's now dark grey and it's perfect for my stash. <laughs> so yes. The glass got... panel looks very pretty. Yes, it's yes, it has it's like um rounded shape as well. Yes, the shape. It's very hard to have it. Just a shame I wouldn't be able I can't repair the clock. But it's good. Mm, it's really very lovely to have such a thing in your home. So pretty. Yeah, it's kind of gives gives you Art Deco vibes. The the shape of this. Uh, this jumper is cable jumper. Cable stitch jumper, just basic cable stitch all over. Made of merino, nice and soft. Too stretchy, maybe. Um, this is one of my first tops I made from Seed the Project. And it's the same style was used in 40s, in 50s, and there are some patterns in 60s, which has almost identical pattern to this one. So that's kind of timeless jumper. And maybe one more jumper to show is um, from the book um, Stitching Time. Um, Jan, Jan Sweater. And this is 1930s pattern, but to be honest, it looks very modern. I do wear it at work and in the different days as well. And it's very, very simple to make because it's most, it's, back and front knitted the same and just then um, sleeves to add. So this is all I can show you for now. Um, I have a few magazines that I sometimes collect which has knitting patterns in them. But it's very difficult to come across magazines that are from 1930s that you can just buy from the shop. So this is little this is probably from early 50s. So it has some nice jumpers in it as well. Um, Are you finding those on the internet or you're finding those at fairs or something? Yes, with the chairs, yeah. With the chairs, I guess, I buy most of my stuff. Even it's related. I don't see vintage yarn around so much in New York. Probably is out there. I'm just not maybe turning over the right stones, but I'm intrigued by that yarn that you showed. Some of these older yarns, and I I really want to reach through my computer screen and touch them. Oh, see how different they feel from contemporary yarns. But you know, from having worked with them, do they feel very different? I would say that quite some of it is quite scratchy. They are they are quite fine. They much finer than normal four ply. Again, with four ply, it's interesting because um, some people call fingering yarn and four ply. They think it's the same. For me, it isn't because there's so many different four plies thicknesses available. Even vintage four ply. If, if I'm looking at this type, this is much 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 thicker four ply. To say. Um, so this one and yet so they're, they're both called they're both called four ply um you're saying this one actually isn't but um actually it isn't um i had somewhere like more than four ply shall say this is more than four ply to the regia um they all have different thicknesses mm -hmm. and the only way to know is probably to count to make a swatch and count stitches. Yeah. 
So it's it's nice to have original yarn so you can check check it and feel it and then check um, modern yarn against it and compare. It's a bit of a conundrum because when a pattern calls for a particular yarn, let's say they say it's, you know, Sirdar Bunny. Well, Sirdar Bunny maybe discontinued 50 years ago. Yeah. How are you going to know what the gauge is? Sometimes they tell you in the pattern, but not always. Yeah, it's really hard to figure out what's the right yarn. And in America, we're not really using the term four ply. I think this is a maybe a British thing. Mm, it is. Um, but I know that there's three ply and four ply and vintage four ply seems to be different from contemporary four ply. So I'm personally very confused. One of these days I have to get somebody on the show who's expert in this who can break it down and explain it um but there's other weights of yarn if you want to go finer you can always go into you know lace weight and combine lace weight with something else that's fine like cobweb yeah. until you get the weight that you really need if if you're going to get that precise about things I think it's just easier to swatch and figure out how many stitches Definitely. you need based on your measurement. If you need, you know, 38 inch bus, how many stitches do you need to get it? But as you say, it is, yes. Uh, because once you've done a few times, you've done project a few times, you know your measurements. What I always do, I look through patterns, but I also check against my measurements, like if I need to adjust widths of sleeves or um, my waist. So I never truly trust the pattern I'm working on. It's, it's, it's important to check your own measurements against you as you need. I think that's the best tip that <laughs> any newbie knitter could have. Yeah, keep checking your measurements and really know your body and it takes it takes a while, and especially some of us, our bodies are changing all the time, you know, every six months, maybe a different weight. But basically, if you're measuring and checking, probably after a while, get a good fit. If you're lucky to have a mannequin that you've padded to be exactly your measurements, well, that's another cool thing. I don't have room in my apartment for that, but... A lot of the people who are on my show, they do have mannequins, and I think those mannequins probably have their measurements. So mm. that helps That's to try it on somebody else and pin it and see where it is. Uh, maybe someday. <laughs> I don't think I'm ever going to have a big house. I seem to be here for the duration, 46 oh. years in this apartment. So oh. it's not likely that I'm going to have I a I know mannequin. how I feel. I live in a small place as well. <laughs> Sometimes small is good. <laughs> I, I yeah. like it. It's a location that may most important business. In real estate, that's what they say. Location, location, location. Yeah. <laughs> and I have a great location. So I'm you do. happy yes. here a long time. Will you tell us your social media name so that people can find you? You have Instagram and Ravelry? Yes, I do. And it's both the called the same. It's called... Uh, vintage dancer needs so you can find me on instagram or ravelry and i'm also appear sometimes in facebook group called vintage knitting in modern world terrific Thank you so much for sharing them is there anything else you want to tell us um just to um to thank you billy for organizing this lovely oh. um chance for us knitters to meet with each other because this is how we see each other really for the video because otherwise we'll be just rubberly or um, Instagram so thank you for your effort you're putting into your program it's very nice to for change <laughs> not thank to be just you. listener but actually participation thank you I'm usually on the thanking end not the receiving end so that's so kind of you and I'm really appreciative. I'm, I'm glad that you've been enjoying sure. it. And I'm happy that the other vintage knitters do get to meet when I do my group reunion things. And there's one coming up pretty soon. So 
be on the lookout for that. All right. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. For being here. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. You didn't tell me you had a hat and a handbag to show. Let's see that. Oh, completely forgot about it. So thank you, Sophie, for showing your lovely hat. And thank you, Billy, for making one. So you inspired me to make my own one. So this is really fine wool. Oh, gosh, I ate it. And I made the matching bag. Again, so I haven't finished it. It's still work in progress. Just need to attach handles and to do lining as well. And it's going to be all done. Matching hat and bag. And did I show you my work in, my current work in progress as well? One of them. Um, I've got Tyrolean cardigan. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be embroidery in this? Yes, embroidery already started. So I wasn't sure about colors when I introduced it, but it's growing on me. So that's my... You do choose things that have a lot of detail, a lot of oh, yeah. extra work. Well, otherwise I can go in, in the shop and buy one. <laughs> so it has to be True. something delicate and... Exactly. That's a good point. Very good point. Okay. <laughs> Bye again. Bye.